When families send their children to public schools, do they forfeit rights to direct their children's education? What can parents reasonably object to regarding public school curriculum, testing, health rules, or student clubs? How do the democratic and civic purposes of public education factor into what parents should and should not be able to demand about what their children learn in school? And to what extent should state policies limit parental actions that result in negative public consequences? Good evening. I'm Michelle Moses. I'm a professor uh, at the CU Boulder School of Education, and I'm also the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies there. Welcome to our discussion, Choosing, Refusing, and Opting Out, Parents' Rights in Public Education. <laughs> if you are a Boulder Valley School District parent like I am, and like three of our panelists are, last week, you may have received an email from the Director of Assessment asking you to inform the district if your child would be refusing to take this year's park exams. The opt-out numbers were so high in BVSD last year that the district wants to be prepared for widespread opting out again. Our panelists tonight will be discussing these issues and more as we in Colorado and in states across the country grapple with conflicts between individual and collective rights related to opting out of, for example, mandatory vaccinations or state assessments. That is, individual decisions with public implications. And then we'll open it up for audience questions and conversation here and virtually through a live tweet wall moderated by doctoral students, Wajma Momandi and Matt Hastings over there somewhere. So please tweet using hashtag edchatcu. I'll say that again, because it's in the corner. Hashtag edchatcu. Our hope is to further the conversation in a deeper and more thoughtful way. So the panel will begin with Kevin Wellner, a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder School of Education. He specializes in education policy and law and directs the National Education Policy Center. His books include Closing the Opportunity Gap, What America Must Do to Give Every Child an Even Chance, and a brand new law school casebook, Education and the Law. Dr. Wellner's remarks will frame the discussion of more prominent cases around parents' rights. Next on the panel will be Dr. Terry Wilson, an assistant professor of educational philosophy and policy who studies issues of school choice and segregation. Tonight, she'll be presenting on a new collaborative research project on recent movements to opt out of state tests. Then Dr. Adam, Hussein, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at CU Boulder, will discuss the politics, policies, and philosophical claims around the controversy over vaccines. His research focuses on moral, political, and legal philosophy with a special interest in issues of religious exemption and discrimination. And finally, Dr. Kristen Davidson will share her research on school choice right here in Boulder Valley, examining the question of why it matters that open enrollment policy increases segregation. Dr. Davidson is a postdoctoral researcher for the National Center for Research in Policy and Practice. All right, so we'll begin with Professor Wellner. So there are two basic rules that govern almost all outcomes for these education cases. The first is that parents have, in general, full authority to make decisions about their children's upbringing, except in cases of, of abuse or severe neglect. 
But the second rule is that parents' discretion largely ends at the schoolhouse door. Once a parent opts to enroll a child in public schools, courts will generally defer to school officials. Uh, and parents cannot interfere with the school's instructional or curricular or safety choices. Those are just two basic rules. I should note that I've ident identified a couple exceptions to these rules, and one of these is simply that a state or school can choose to, decide, to, uh, uh, to put in a statute or a rule to expand parental rights, something that may be relevant to the opt-out discussion uh, of te testing opt-out. I'll also note that these two rules arguably do not provide much of an answer for the vaccination issue that Adam will be discussing. But before diving into all of that, what I want to do is to set the stage by illustrating these rules and using some important court decisions to highlight the very real tensions that exist in this area between the interests of parents, of the state, and even of students whose interests are often simplistically assumed to be represented by either the parents or the state. I'm tempted to begin with two prominent Supreme Court cases from the 1920s, but I want to go back even further to start, all the way back to ancient Sparta, where boys were taken from parents at the age of seven and raised by the state because they were seen as belonging to the state, as creatures of the state. And it's helpful to think of Sparta as, encomp as, as encapsulating the idea that, an idea that courts um, in the U.S. have long rejected. When, when the state attempts to control a child's upbringing, courts will generally step in because they are wary of this sort of overstepping, the Sparta sort of overstepping. So with that in mind, let's consider the two cases from the 1920s. Uh, the first case is Meyer v. Nebraska, a US, and the U.S. Supreme Court in that case struck down a World War I-era anti-German law that criminalized the teaching of, of a foreign language. And the second case is Pierce v. Society of Sisters, where the U.S. Supreme Court struck down an anti-Catholic law that required children to attend only public schools, which at the time were effectively Protestant schools. So both of these cases illustrate the tensions that can arise between parents and the state. And they illustrate that first basic rule, that it is not the state but parents who have the authority to make decisions about their children's upbringing. Fast forward now to 1972, and the most well-known case in this area, it's called Yoder versus Wisconsin. The Supreme Court blocked the state from enforcing against parents in an Amish community a law that required formal schooling through the age of 16. The Amish insisted that their religious beliefs prevented them from sending their children to school after the eighth grade. The court held that criminalizing this religiously motivated practice violated the Amish, pro Amish parents' due process liberty interests in raising their children, as well as their rights under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. Like the Pierce and, Myers and Meyer cases, the Yoder decision stands for the proposition that parents have this authority to make decisions about their children's upbringing. And, since the ch and, and they did this also in part because it's the court, and this is a, a large portion of the Yoder decision, the court was very uh, careful to look at the situation and decide this was not a case of, of abuse or severe neglect um, in analyzing sort of the, the long history of the Amish community and the sort of the healthy relationships that the children have in their community. But note here that the Amish parents did not try to change practices within the school. They just wanted the right not to attend the formal school. So before moving on to cases where parents do try to change practices within the school, I want to discuss a dissent uh, by Justice William Douglas uh, in the Yoder case. Douglas argued that the, that the court's majority had failed to account for the possibility that the 14 or 15 year old Amish children, remember call these are eighth graders, may have interests different from their parents' interests. These are eighth, moving into ninth grade, I should say. And what Douglas wrote was, no analysis of religious liberty claims can take place in a vacuum. If the parents in this case are allowed a religious ex exemption, the inevitable effect 
is to impose the parents' notions of religious duty upon their children. Where the child is mature enough to express potentially conflict conflicting desires, it would be an invasion of the child's rights to permit such an imposition without canvassing his, keep in mind this was 1972, his views. And if an Amish child desire, desires to attend high school and is mature enough to have that desire respected, the state may well be able to override the parents' religiously motivated objections. And later in the dissent he added, it is the student's judgment, not his parents, that is essential if we are to give full meaning to what we have said about the Bill of Rights and of the right of students to be masters of their own destiny. To illustrate the more uh, recent curriculum battles, where parents do attempt to change the way that children are taught in public schools, I'll discuss a case from 30 years ago called Mozart versus Hawkins County, a class action filed by some self-described born-again Christian uh, parents in Tennessee who objected to the school's curriculum, particularly some readings. The parents asserted that any value-laden reading curriculum that did not affirm the truth of their beliefs would offend their religious convictions. So they wanted their children to be excused from lessons and be given alternative readings, and they argued that the free exercise clause gave them the right to require this of the district. But the court held that the Constitution does not give parents the right to demand that their children, once enrolled in public school, be protected from exposure, this is the quote, exposure to objectionable material. The school can choose to excuse students from, uh, from such lessons, and by the way, that does often happen, but their parents cannot demand that it is a matter of legal right. So this is the second rule. Parents' discretion largely ends at the schoolhouse door, and once a parent opts to enroll a child in public school, courts will defer to school officials and parents cannot interfere with the school's instructional or curricular choices. Part of the reason that judges generally consider them, part of the reason for this is that ju judges generally consider themselves unqualified to second guess educators and elected policymakers. But part of it is also because of a concern by the court that a multiplicity of individual parental decisions, if honored, could undermine the ability of schools to do their jobs. So at this point, some of you may be noting that opting out of testing resembles the Mozart situation. Parents want the school to excuse their children from participating in a part of the school curriculum that they object to. But there are several interesting elements that complicate the situation. For example, as noted earlier, states and districts might legislate. They might legislate a rule that allows for opting out. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that will be taken up in, in the state legislature here and elsewhere this year. Certainly it's being discussed uh, in, in D.C. with the Department of Education regulations. Also, what happens if it's the student, not the parent, making the opt-out decision? And the action is taken for political reasons. This brings into play an entirely different body of First Amendment case law concerning student speech, where the general question that courts ask is whether the student's speech causes a, quote, substantial disruption, unquote, to school activities. If it came to that point, my guess is that courts today would rule against the students, uh, but it's an interesting question. The bottom line, I think, is a political one, uh, and that's if a school district is committed to cracking down on opt-out practices, it probably can impose academic punishments, such as lowered grades or after-school detention. But setting aside the legal issues, this would be a political disaster, particularly if there were a large number of students involved. The school has a great deal of control over individual students, but a large number of students and their families have a great deal of control over schools. There's an old uh, adage that if you owe the bank $10,000 and you can't pay it, you're in trouble, but if you owe the bank $10 million and you can't pay it, the bank is in trouble. And I, I think that's pretty much what this would come down to. So let me turn this over to Terry. Are you next? Yeah. Um, I'm Terry Wilson, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about opting out. Um, so through widespread opt-out efforts over the past two years, parent activists have pressured school districts, states, and the federal government to reconsider the extent 
and limits on state-mandated assessment. Other critics, however, including prominent civil rights groups, have argued that opt-out efforts undermine broader public value of collecting high-quality assessment data for all students. In these ways, I think the opt-out movement represents a new front in long-standing philosophical debates about the proper scope of state and family authority over the provision of education. So in my remarks this evening, I'm hoping to raise a few philosophical questions about how we might think about parents' rights in the context of opting out. For instance, what are the values at stake when parents opt their children out of state assessments? In what ways might parents' efforts to opt their children out of tests differ from refusing some of the other dimensions of education that Kevin just mentioned? And in what ways might parents' choices to refuse assessments potentially conflict with public goals for education, such as accountability and equity? I want to say from the outset that these are morally complex questions and ones that are certainly pressing for me as both a parent and educator. Michelle and I are in the very early stages of a new research project focused on these issues. So I'm not going to be posing any definitive answers tonight, um, but I hope to raise a few productive questions for all of us, parents, teachers, students, community members, to think through when we're considering the opt-out movement. Um, just by way of a quick outline, um, I'll start with just a little context about opting out here in Colorado and in Boulder Valley, and outline some of the many varied reasons that parents and students have opted out of assessments. I'll then focus on one challenge to these claims, the argument, one posed by civil rights groups, that opt-out efforts threaten the collection of data focused on educational inequality. I'll then offer one possible tension for us to think through. I'll suggest there might be a conflict between opting out of state assessments when positioned as political action with that of opting out that's positioned as an individual right. So first, just a little bit about the opt-out movement here in Colorado. Um, in Colorado last spring, participation rates range statewide. This is data that just came out in December. Um, from a high of 95% of all third graders in the state participated in the park exam, this is for ELA, but the math rates are similar, to a low of about 50% in 11th grade. And this is statewide. Um, participation rates are in blue, and formal opt-out rates are in orange. So they don't always equal 100 because some students didn't have a formal opt-out form from their parents. Um, while these are statewide averages, it's important to note that certain districts and communities had much higher rates of refusing the test. And opt-out efforts were particularly strong in suburban districts. A total of more than 30,000 students in Boulder Valley, Douglas County, and Cherry Creek sat out of the test last spring. And here quickly are some of the participation rates for some of the major districts in the Denver area. They ranged of a high of about 93% in Adams and 92% in Denver, to lows of 67% in Boulder Valley, 70% in Douglas County, and 72% in Cherry Creek. But as Chalkbeat recently reported, some of the highest rates of non-participation were actually in rural districts. Um, for example, the Dolores County School District in southwestern Colorado had the lowest participation rate of any district in Colorado. Only 8.4% of their students, or really just 13 of their 155 students, took the test. And as the Dolores County Superintendent said, and this is the quote on the bottom, parents are tired of their kids being stressed out over a test that doesn't mean anything to them. They're tired of their teachers being beat up when they're busting their butts to do what is best for their kids. And they're tired of districts and schools being labeled failures when they know they're not. But I have to say what was most striking to me in looking at the data were the big differences in non-participation by grade level. So taking a closer look at Boulder Valley specifically, you can see how participation rates really dropped off by grade level. 92% of third grade students participated, but only 27% of 11th grade students did. And in BVSD, the high district-wide rates of non-participation were really driven by the actions of high school students. And these were particularly pronounced in a couple of high schools. And here you have the four largest high schools in Boulder Valley. And you can see at Boulder High School, for instance, nearly every 11th grader refused to take the test. Similarly, only eight students at, um, took the 11th grade ELA assessment at Fairview, and not a single 11th grader took it at Centaurus. Monarch High School had very different rates of participation, but still it's important to note only 55% of their 11th graders participated in the exam. And these again are ELA, but the math results are similar. 
So the reasons that parents and students offer in opposing state assessments are diverse and varied. And some, and I want to underscore only some of the reasons include the following. First, the sheer amount of time spent testing, especially true at the high school level where tests are often combined with ACT, SAT, IB, AP, et cetera. Beyond time, there's the concern that schools have been caught up in a larger culture of test preparation that both drives and narrows curriculum and instruction. And here, many parents' objections are rooted in deep beliefs about what they think education should be and a concern that education is moving away from these ideals, be they ones of creativity, critical thinking, intellectual engagement, or citizenship. Other parents mentioned the harms posed to their children in terms of anxiety and stress. Still other claims focus on the use and misuse of tests for high stakes accountability decisions, both within classrooms and in districts. Others link the use of state assessments to the deprofessionalization of teaching and the fact that we don't trust teachers to assess their own students. Likewise, teachers have also raised objections to the problematic use of assessment data for teacher evaluation decisions. Others note that annual tests come in too late to have any meaningful impact on classroom instruction. Still others link assessments to broader market-based reforms and specifically object to private funding go or public funding going to private test companies. Some parents have also raised concerns about the privacies and uses of student data, and other parents are concerned about the Common Core standards themselves and oppose any assessments that are linked to and further these standards. For still others, parents should just simply have the right to direct their children's education more closely. So the choice to opt out is an assertion and a protection of parents' rights. So, as it may be clear from this big list, um, the opt-out movement has a broad and politically diverse collection of support. This support has led to some interesting new political alliances, but also, as I'll suggest in a minute, some possible tensions. But given this giant list of reasons, one might be tempted to say, why don't we all opt out? Is there any reason to take the test? And there are, of course, many voices and positions that argue in favor of state assessments including school reform organizations, federal and state authorities, and assessment developers. But for the purposes of our conversation tonight, I want to focus in on one argument in favor of testing that I see as the most persuasive. I also think it's the one that has been most difficult for opt-out advocates to address. And last May, a dozen civil rights groups, including the NAACP and the National Council of La Raza, released a statement opposing what they called anti-testing efforts. They argued that new, improved, standardized tests provide crucial information for addressing educational inequalities. As they wrote, and this is the first quote there, when parents opt out of tests, even when out of protest for legitimate concerns, they're not only making a choice for their own child, they're inadvertently making a choice to undermine efforts to improve schools for every child. So in effect, opt-out movements undermine the quality and validity of assessment data with negative outcomes for the least advantaged students. For these groups, we need comprehensive statewide and comparable assessments to document and understand educational disparities, especially ones across lines of race, class, gender, and special education status. And as Mark Morial, president of the National Urban League, wrote last fall, and this is the second quote, Throughout our history, the civil rights movement has relied upon data to identify and address disparities that affect African Americans and under, other underserved communities. From st striking down segregation in Brown v. Board versus education, of education, to shining a light on the school to prison pipeline, data have been used to advocate for civil rights in education. Without these information, these groups fear that schools and districts would be able to hide achievement gaps, as well as the inequities in resources and opportunities that contribute to those gaps. And here I think it's crucial to note that these groups are not defending the many problematic uses and consequences of these assessments, and are often quite critical of the ways in which an overemphasis on testing has narrowed curriculum and also contributed to many high-stakes accountability decisions, removing control of schools from many urban communities. Yet while they're not endorsing the current uses or misuses of tests, their argument does underscore the broader public value of ensuring that high quality assessment data is collected for all students. I believe that this challenge also shines a light on an emerging tension in the opt-out movement, and it's one I hope we can think through together. In particular, the opt-out movement often combines 
sometimes in uneasy tension, two very different claims. First, many activists make a claim rooted in parents' rights discourse, that parents have the right to refuse curriculum that conflicts with their values. Second, for many, refusing the test is a political act. It's a critique of current directions in school reform. Here, opting out is one part of a broader political strategy designed to force change in the system. So while aiming for political change, many parents, in actually opting their children out of district and state assessments, have both built on and incorporated many of the parents' rights arguments used to challenge school curricula, programs, and activities. And here is where I see some risks in how we frame our choices, as well as some possible tensions in those many different politically diverse claims that we dealt with before. So in part because of these diverse claims, the opt-out movement has been politically influential. Many states have considered or adopted legislation that would solidify the rights of parents to opt out of state tests. And just last fall, former Secretary of State of Education, Arne Duncan, acknowledged concerns about overtesting in schools. Noting that federal policy has played a role in driving the expansion of testing, he called for more meaningful tests limited to no more than 2% of instructional time per year. While this was a turning point, states and districts, as well as school leaders and teachers, are still being asked to respond to a variety of different parent, community, and student concerns about the place of assessment in education. I think these concerns pose morally and philosophically complex questions about how refusing certain assessments might affect public education and might affect democratic goals. And the, quench, the question and the tension I hope to leave us with is this. Are there ways in these conversations of reframing the choice to refuse the test to not simply be an exercise of parents' rights, but as a political act that aims both at systemic change and equity for all children. Doing so, I think, demands that we wrestle with and thoughtfully address the concerns raised by civil rights groups and consider the value of careful, reasonable, fair, and perhaps infrequent measures of how all students are doing. Crafting the solution will not be easy. It will require tough conversations and political compromises. But I want to suggest that perhaps we should do more than opt our individual children out of tests. Perhaps our choices can be linked to broader political arguments about changing the places and uses of assessment in education, but also in reasserting its potential value for building equitable opportunities to learn for all children. Vaccines. So I'm not a, an epidemiologist or anything like that. I'm not here to talk about the details of vaccine science. What I want to talk to you guys about are some more abstract issues about when and how the state should regulate people's behavior, especially the behavior of parents in this case. And specifically, what I'm interested in is this claim, often made by anti-vaccine campaigners, that parents have a right to determine what vaccines their children get, even if their kids are in, in public schools. And why is that? Because uh, according to these campaigners, that's a personal choice about the direction of their child's life, and that's why they have a right to decide. So is that true? Is this a purely personal decision that should be left just to parents? Well, I think one good reason to think not is that what we're concerned with here are infectious diseases. And when someone gets an infectious disease, that's not just a problem for them, that's a social problem, because um, it implicates harms to other people also. Why is that? Because the relevant diseases, pertussis, uh, measles, rubella, and so on, are communicable. An infected child who's sent to school um, puts other children at risk, potentially, and also other members of the community. And you might say, well, OK, um, if you're so worried about that, why don't you just vaccinate your child? But it's not that easy. Uh, so for instance, uh, there are plenty of children who can't be vaccinated for good medical reasons for instance, because they are immune compromised or something like that. So to protect those children, what we need is uh, what's called herd immunity, which is where a sufficient level of the population is um, immune so that even if some, um, some disease is introduced into that population, you won't see an outbreak. So for measles, for instance, you need about 95% of the population immunized. Compare other cases where um, my actions affect other people's interests, indeed their most fundamental interests. And that's what we're concerned with here, uh, fundamental interests in health and even in, in life. Um, prior to the introduction of vaccine, 
uh, measles used to infect about 4 million children a year and used to kill about 500. So these are serious um, interests at stake. So compare, for instance, someone's uh, lighting fires on their mountain property. That seems like something that the state should regulate. Uh, driving recklessly, that seems like something the state should regulate. Someone wants to send their kids to uh, school with fireworks on the 4th of July. Seems like something where the state should regulate. Okay, so if we're agreed that there ought to be a regulation here, and I think you should agree with that even if you're generally against vaccines, you should agree that infectious diseases are generally speaking an area where the state ought to step in, we've got to decide uh, which regulations to make and, uh, and what basis we're going to make those. So what are we going to do? Well, one thing you can do if you're trying to decide um, which regulations to support when you're voting and lobbying and so on is uh, you can Google around on the internet and uh, see various views out there, and you'll find that there are a lot of views. So uh, here's uh, one set of views. This is this guy, uh, Peter Duisberg, uh, eminent biochemist, in fact, a winner of the Nobel Prize. Uh, and these are some of his views. These are not the views for which he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> thinks that uh, HIV does not lead to AIDS. Uh, in fact, AIDS is a lifestyle disease that you get from bad lifestyle, um, and also a disease that you, in fact, get from the very antiretroviral drugs that the CDC recommends you use um, if you have HIV to not get it. And he says, you shouldn't trust the CDC, however, because all of these recommendations are only there because of the financial interests of large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, okay, you know, seems like a smart guy. Maybe these claims seem kind of plausible. They parallel a lot of the claims made by anti-vaccine protesters about the role of pharmaceutical companies, about uh, va uh, vaccine protesters say that uh, it's actually the vaccines themselves that cause the relevant diseases. So what should we do? Should we go with Duisberg's views? That's an option. Uh, actually, it's already been tried. It was tried particularly by Thabo Mbeki, the former uh, president of South Africa, and the result was that about 300,000 South Africans died unnecessarily of AIDS. South Africans who, whose lives could have been saved um, by receiving antiretroviral drugs, but for Thabo Mbeki's policy. Now, Mbeki was a smart guy, but he made a huge error. Where exactly did he go wrong? Well, there's a difference between the following two strategies when you're deciding which regulations to support. The first strategy is the Google around and find your favorite opinion strategy, which is essentially the one that Becky used, albeit without Google. Um, and then the second strategy is to accept the consensus views of the scientific community as a whole, not just the views that, as you look around, seem most attractive to you or associated with one particular expert, but the, the, the views of the scientific community as a whole. Those are the views that have been rigorously tested through peer review, and those are the reviews that have been subject to disputation in the best scientific and medical journals. And that alternative was tried with respect to AIDS in the United States. And uh, you can see the results there. Um, rates of HIV continued to rise through the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. However, when the United States introduced antiretroviral drugs, um, AIDS deaths rapidly plummeted. Success. And if we use that same strategy when it comes to vaccines, the not Google around and pick our favorite view strategy, but the go with the consensus views of the scientific community um, strategy, we can see that um, an overwhelming majority of academic scientists recommend that children be, uh, that parents be required to vaccinate their children. Specifically, since I'm giving this talk in Boulder, I'll, I'll note that um, what's recommended is the standard vaccine schedule um, as, as recommended by the CDC, not the alternative vaccine schedules that are um, adopted by some parents in Boulder. Um, uh, not all states have followed those recommendations, and uh, these orange states, these are the states, including Colorado, where um, um, levels of vaccine uh, use have declined in the last four years or so. And as you can also see by looking at the red lines there, um, these are also the states, uh, disproportionately, where there have recently been major outbreaks of measles. And sure enough, that's exactly what the studies in the best journals predict. As you can see, these are studies in the journal, mostly in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, it's, it's, you can find almost any view published somewhere in some journal. But uh, when you're trying to figure out what to, what to think about this, I would recommend that you look to the very best journals where 
peer review process is the most rigorous. Um, so, so far we've seen that this is an area where there needs to be regulation and we've seen that what the scientific consensus recommends is that um, uh, the regulations require parents to uh, vaccinate their children who are going to public schools. Should we allow any exemptions from these regulations? Uh, here in particular, it's, uh, the, the, the important question is whether we should allow uh, so-called personal belief exemptions. This is the exemption that's by far the most widely used in Colorado and in Boulder. And people use the personal belief exemption when they have an objection that's not based on the medical needs of their child or based on their religious views, but based on their beliefs that the standard schedule is either ineffective or is damaging. Should we allow people to exempt their children on that basis? Well, let's compare some other cases where uh, individuals disagree with, this, with the, the uh, science behind a state policy, someone says. I don't accept the government's claims about fire hazards, so I want to burn my land as I please. That's the claim that um, the Bundy brothers have recently tried to defend. Um, that seems like a case where there ought not to be an exemption. I think climate change is a myth, so I refuse to obey the EPA emissions regulations. Uh, no exemption there either, nor does any one exemption seem justified. Um, or uh, 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 I want to send my children to school with uh, uh, fireworks on the 4th of July. I don't believe in the government statistics about the harmfulness of, of, uh, of fireworks. No exemption justified there either. Um, it might also be worth comparing the present case with cases where exemptions do seem to have some greater justification. So take, for instance, the Amish case that Kevin was talking about earlier. And there are two factors there that are missing in the present case. Firstly, uh, uh, well, part of what was at stake there was the ability of Amish parents to pass on their values to their children. That's not at stake here. If your child gets vaccinated, that doesn't in any way prevent you from passing on your values. The second thing that was, was present in the Amish case is um, that uh, the beliefs that Amish parents would have to give up on in order to accept that policy were not just um, disagreements over particular scientific claims, but core beliefs at the center of their conception of meaning in life and of the sacred. And that's not the case here either. In some, then, I think we ought to abolish the personal belief exemption in Colorado. Uh, you can uh, try to do that by using your vote, lobbying, and advocating. Um, I'm a little less certain about what to say about the religious exemption, because in that case, there are, for instance, say, Christian scientists for whom uh, vaccinating their children would require them to give up on a core belief about the sacred. Christian scientists believe in the power of prayer to overcome disease. Uh, but definitely the pers personal belief exemption has to go. Thank you. I'm Kristen Davidson talking about school choice. Um, I clearly remember the moment when I heard about open enrollment in Boulder Valley School District, or BVSD, over a dozen years ago now. I was thrilled that I could choose among so many wonderful public school options. We enrolled our daughter in BCSIS, an arts-focused elementary school, and loved the community there. A few years later, we moved to the Lafayette area and open enrolled both of our children into Douglas, although we lived within the boundaries of Lafayette schools. I quickly became aware of a division in our neighborhood between parents who strongly supported the neighborhood schools and those who open and rolled out. And I became fascinated with the constant talk about schools among parents. Everywhere, people were talking about finding the right fit. For those of you who are currently choosing schools, I know it's a particularly anxious time as you anticipate notification next week about whether or not your child got in. I can't alleviate those feelings. But I would like to offer a way of thinking more deeply about how we choose schools and what the consequences of those choices entail. So it strikes me that parents' actions in opting out of testing or refusing vaccinations or choosing certain schools can be a reaction to perceived harms to our children, whether those harms are experienced and known or anticipated and feared. When we take these actions, we're primarily concerned with the individual consequences for our own children. And that's our number one responsibility as parents, right? But any human action 
also has consequences on other people. John Dewey, an American philosopher of education, explains that when the shared consequences of human actions are significant enough to require control, a public is formed. He says it's then the role of policy to define limits to just to the extent that the consequences of individual actions are more predictable and harms to members of the public are reduced. Importantly, these limits should be determined democratically through negotiation among diverse perspectives. So I'm suggesting we think about not only the individual consequences for our children when we choose schools, but also consider the shared consequences that result in how we might think about better outcomes for our community. So an, an important and difficult shared consequence of parental choice of schools in BVSD, and this is happening in school choice systems across the country, is that our schools have become increasingly segregated by race or ethnicity and socioeconomic status. In a district of 30,000 students, about 22% receive free and reduced lunch, but individual schools range from anywhere from 3 to 79% of students on free or reduced lunch. 69% of students in the district are white, but schools range from 27 to 89% white. 19% of students in BVSD are Latino, but schools range from 5 to 68% Latino, and 6% of students identify as Asian American, but schools range anywhere from 1 to 22% Asian American. In the year 2000, professors Ken Howe and Margaret Eisenhart from the CU Boulder School of Education conducted a study on open enrollment in BVSD and found clear patterns of white flight. So to create this graph, they broke school populations into quintiles by the percentage of white students. So there are five groups here. This bottom line represents the 20% of schools with the lowest proportions of white students. The top line represents the 20% of schools with the highest proportions of white students, and the others are the three quintiles in between. The line itself is the median percentage of white students in each quintile. So you can see in this bottom quintile that there was a sharp decline in white students in these schools from the beginning of open enrollment in 1994 with a median of 68% white students to the year 2000 with a median of 44% white. <coughs> Continuing this graph to this year, from 2000 to this year, we see that we've since been in more or less a holding pattern with the median percentage of white students in the bottom quintile now at 38%. In other words, over 20 years of open enrollment policy, the proportion of white students in those schools has dropped by almost half. And school segregation through open enrollment is adding another layer on top of residential segregation. So why is this outcome occurring? To better understand this, I studied how 36 parents in BVSD actually went about choosing schools for their kids. School choice policies in the US have been framed on a market model that assumes the parents will choose the best performing school which will spur competition for all schools to attract students, and this competition will lift all boats. So this is an actual cartoon from, from um, a school choice policy report that claims the way parents make choices about schools are similar to this mom who's reaching for the Striver cereal. Uh, you know, other options are expressionist, <laughs> test scores, multicultural. But parents' actual desires for schools and decision-making processes are much more complex. First, parents' decisions are importantly informed by their social networks. Parents in my study discussed schools and shared their experiences within their social groups at cocktail parties, book clubs, Funko nights, the bus stop, sports practices, and so on. Some conducted online research, but all developed impressions of schools based on anecdotes they heard and sometimes described associations they made, such as a higher poverty school, meaning lower quality academics. In addition, many described the importance of a feeling of comfort when they visited school open houses. The people the parents talked with not only were typically like-minded, but, but many parents also expressed that they weighed more heavily the opinions of parents who seemed more like themselves. For example, Heather said, not just any parent could have told me about their experience with the school, 
It would have to be somebody whose opinion mattered to me or made sense to me. And if someone very dissimilar from me had told me things about the school, I would think, well, that worked for that person. It would be totally wrong for us. I ask people who are different from you in what ways? Kind of the way they raise their children, the values they have as a family, their actions as a family, that kind of thing. So like Heather's statement here, these sentiments reflected a desire to be in a school community that shared similar values, including having similar parenting practices. The parenting practices of the empowered parents in my study, who are mostly moms, included being actively involved in their kids' education and volunteering regularly, enrolling them in multiple extracurricular activities, monitoring social behavior, involving them in decision-making, and teaching them to advocate for themselves. So in fact, parental decision-making can actually look much more like this than the mom in the cereal aisle. <laughs> Through their active involvement, parents developed close connections with teachers and gained insider information about schools. Parents explained that they saw their relationships with teachers as one of partnership, but stepped into an advocate role when necessary. Advocacy was especially salient for parents whose kids had special needs, given that when their kids' needs weren't met, it impacted the whole family. So Amy said, explained, if my son ends up going to a school that doesn't meet his needs, that would be a lot more of me helping him at the counter. And that's happened before in years where he just can't understand what's happening in the classroom. It's like the learning during the day just doesn't happen and we have to sit at the kitchen counter and do things a little different. And I have to read up on what exactly that math lesson is and then we get out different things in the kitchen and count or do whatever it takes. In years past, it has just been hours at the kitchen counter. So that's why I work part time and not full time because there's no end. Parents like Amy, therefore, are not only considering the consequences for their child, but also the very real consequences for their own lives. So when teachers sometimes advised for or against certain schools for their children, parents sometimes developed anxiety about choosing the right school. Diane said, we had my child's teacher saying very clearly that she thought that Central Middle would be a very big mistake for her, without me even saying any of the information that I had already heard. So yeah, these things coupled together. I wish it wasn't that way because that's our home school. I wish it was easier. That makes it awfully difficult. Frankly, the whole open enrollment process has been a major trial and challenge for me. So I wish that the teachers had said, oh yeah, you don't need to worry about open enrollment. Her school is perfect for her. I feel like they dangle a carrot in front of you and then they take it away, pull it away. Well, this is the best place for my child. Her teachers say so, all the kids I talk to say so, my neighbors say so, the people at South Middle that I know say so. But it's like, oh sorry, you might not get in. Bummer. This anxiety was deeply connected to parents' aspirations for their children. When I asked parents what they most wanted for their kids' education, they almost always immediately reflected on their own childhood. For example, one parent described how an Ivy League education had opened doors for her and wanted that for her kids. Another valued her experiences in diverse schools and saw diversity as essential to a good education. Another had traumatic experiences that informed her concern with social emotional well-being and so on. So what parents wanted for their children was deeply connected to their own intergenerational experiences. So while parents' aspirations were personal, they basically fell into one of three groups that I called seeking the best, preserving the neighborhood, and defending diverse schools. All were wonderful parents doing what they thought was best for their kids and all wanted good academics. <clears throat> but parents who were seeking the best most cared about a rigorous academic environment with other families who valued the same. They stated that they wanted the best school possible for their children and chose schools that offered the strongest academics. Parents who were preserving the neighborhood wanted their kids to go to school with friends who lived in their neighborhood community and chose their residence with this in mind. They claimed their kids' school did not need to be the best of the best, but rather one that was good enough. They only considered alternatives from the neighborhood school if they heard something that raised a red flag. Parents who I characterized as defending diverse schools valued diverse experiences as essential to a good education for their children. They wanted schools that were welcoming, inclusive, and down to earth, and chose diverse schools. This is overly simplistic, but you get the idea. It's important to recognize that across all three groups, parents were choosing like-minded communities, and that distinct cultures characterized the schools they chose. 
Some argue that a benefit of school choice is that families are able to be members of distinct school communities in a pluralistic society. But three points are important here. First, segregation is importantly associated with dramatically unequal mm. access to quality schools, health care, housing, public services, safety, well-paying jobs, and civic participation. In BVSD schools, parent fundraising that pays for important educational benefits are, is dramatically unequal, with affluent schools raising up to $100,000 per year and high poverty schools struggling to raise 15,000. And schools with demographic diversity demonstrate richer learning environments, improved academic achievement, um, excuse me, graduation rates, college enrollment, and workforce preparation, and friendship formation that serves to break down stereotypes, improve intercultural understanding, and lead to more diverse social lives in adulthood. However, successfully integrating schools requires thoroughgoing integration within school environments that in turn triggers the need for other educational reforms. Second, as Professor Ken Howe points out, when a school is formed around a distinctive community, we must carefully consider what kind of community it aims to foster. Latino parents in my study recounted experiences of enrolling their children in highly academic schools only to leave due to their kids' feeling of not belonging among affluent peers with huge houses. I would argue that when the cultures of schools become exclusive, they are not truly serving the public. Instead, the communities we, cre we create in public schools should reflect the kind of democratic society we aim to foster, one that is based on the free and equal exchange of diverse perspectives. Third, John Dewey explains that individual interests and identities are not laying dormant prior to experience ready to unfold. Rather, interests and identities are formed in social experiences, such as kids' daily lives in schools. When we seek the right fit for our kids, we are importantly choosing a direction in which our children's identities will develop. And just as we saw the influence of intergenerational experiences on the settings in which we parents feel comfortable, we can imagine the intergenerational impact of offering our children diverse experiences. So this brings us back to the idea of a democratic public where we recognize the shared consequences of our actions. With a political will, I believe there is potential to change these outcomes in our community. The great majority of parents thought that diversity in schools was important and supported measures to increase access to choice for all families, such as increasing information, offering English as a second language, services in all schools, providing transportation, and so on. But the complexity of parental decision-making processes shows that even with full equal access to open enrollment, which is necessary at a bare minimum, parents will continue to choose like-minded communities. So I conclude with a question of how, as parents and educators, we can participate in defining changes that might limit the consequences of individual decisions that result in communities of sameness for ourselves and our kids. I ask that we think deeply about what a good education looks like for our children and act in new democratic ways to help create that for our community. All right, I want to say thank you to all of the panelists. So we heard about parents' legal rights. We heard about opt-out movements and questions raised about those related to equity. We heard about controversies over vaccines based on exemptions due to personal belief or religious exemptions. And we just heard about school choice right here in Boulder. Um, so we are going to take questions now. Yep, and one, one moment. And if um, you don't want to raise your hand and ask a question, please tweet your question to hashtag edchatcu, and we'll take questions that way also. Okay. Hi, this question is for Adam. Hi, Adam. My name is Robin. I'm with the Colorado Coalition for Vaccine Choice. I want to start off by offering you Am I not projecting? <laughs> a, little, a little tidbit for your PowerPoint. Um, it was April of 2015 that Dr. Richard Horton, the editor-in-chief of the Lancet Journal, came out and said that he feels that probably half of all scientific literature 
is false, that peer review is not what we once thought it was. I just wanted to offer that to you because I didn't think you knew it. So I'm listening to you and I hear you, but as the mother of a vaccine injured child, I have to say, I'm a little offended that you didn't speak to any of the risks or any of the damage that happens to some of our children. And whether the risk is 0.0001% or 1%, when it hits your kid, it's 100%. And for me, I spend tens of thousands of dollars a year in treating my child in emergency hospitalizations. I don't know if you know, but in 1913, Charles Richet won the Nobel Prize for vaccination. He invented anaphylaxis. And so now we're manufacturing vaccines with food proteins in them, like um, casein, um, beef, chicken, egg, things like that. And you know, those are some of the top food allergens in children today. And kids like mine are not rare. They're diagnosed at a rate of about 300,000 new cases of food allergy per year. So we're, we're certainly not um, a one in a million vaccine injury. And my kid sees two of the top allergists in the country, if not the world, one here in Denver and one in New York City. And they have both told me, they all know, this epidemic is from vaccines, but they're forbidden from researching it, that that's simply against university policy. And I want to know, Adam, where in your talk, where does my kid fit in? Where do the millions of kids like my kid fit in to this one-size-fits-all vaccination policy for school? Thanks. Thanks for your question. Uh, so I wasn't able to address, there, there's, there's been a lot of different types of objection people have made to vaccines. They've objected both to the efficacy of vaccines, and they've also objected to the safety of vaccines, which is the issue that you raised. And I wasn't able to address each of those concerns individually, because I only had 10 minutes. But what I've tried to suggest is, what I've tried to ask of people is, well, what's the general approach we should take here when we're trying to figure out whether the, the benefits of vaccines generally uh, uh, outweigh the potential risks? And I've suggested that if we're going to have a policy that makes sense, the best way to figure that out is to ask, is to look to the scientific consensus and not to just look to whichever expert some particular person happens to prefer. And as we saw, the scientific consensus overwhelmingly says that the benefits outweigh the costs. Now, individual parents, of course, might say, I disagree, I think I've seen something else. But um, those aren't views that have gone through the full peer review process. So uh, I don't really, I just have a kind of general, I, we, we don't really have time here to get into every possible um, uh, uh, claim people have made about efficacy or about safety, but uh, what, I'm just, what, I'm, what I'm trying to ask people is, what do you think is really the sensible way to think about both of those issues in general? And I've presented my reasons for, um, for thinking that we should do things the way I've proposed. Other questions? Thank you. Um, my question to you, Adam, is how come there is nobody on the, ch on the panel who has the attitude of that nice lady back there that there should always be the personal choice exemption? It seems that the attitude is stacked against her points, and I happen to agree with her points. I used to be a nurse, and I have seen patients die from adverse effects of various medications. And don't forget, vaccines are medications, but the uh, vaccination manufacturers would have you believe that vaccines are sacred cows, and you can't question that. I also don't agree totally with uh, appeal to authority because when parents have children who are damaged by vaccines, a lot of times their doctors will say, oh, there couldn't possibly be a connection between the damage and the vaccines. But the doctors are often wrong. And uh, I, I have a, a little piece of paper here with some information I'd like to just give you. So bring you just give that to him if you would. So my question again is why isn't there somebody on your panel who believes that the personal exemption should be sacred and kept in place? Thank, thanks for your, I'll just say one thing. 
Thank, thanks for your comment. Um, I understand, uh, I, I really understand why people uh, are very uh, uh, concerned about this issue and it raises a lot of emotions. There can be nothing worse than the thought of harming one's own child. But, um, but uh, I have to disagree with you, unfortunately. I've, I've made the points so and uh, I've explained why. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify, we, we are almost speaking to different issues. There was only one person speaking to the vaccine issue. So I, I think you're, you're assuming there, there might be some sort of um, party lineup here. No, I'm saying the one person was for vaccines. Uh, but this, this, just to be clear. saying that vaccines are God-given things. And you need to have the other side of the story, what I'm saying. Say the <laughs> conception. Right. Part of the reason for the question and answer is to bring out those really interesting comments and questions. The question here, and then we're going to go to a Twitter question, and then right here. Yeah? I, I would ask a question of the, our last speaker, Christine Davidson, um, about the choice issues. And, um, oh, sure. Uh, also, as a parent in BVSD, I mean, I, some of my instincts recently have been just that it's a bad policy and it kind of just creates a lot of, uh, you know, energy and waste and cost that is silly, the, the choice policies in BVSD. You also, I think, would acknowledge and, and sort of point it out as well that if we had no choice policies, you could have a situation where in a place where there's a lot of residential segregation, you, there'd be other reasons for segregation. So you could have schools segregated uh, in either situation. And I guess I'm, I'm just curious, and this is a very genuine question, if you thought about, um, because you kind of posed it at the end, but I, I guess I'm asking you to answer the question you posed at the end. <laughs> um, if the end goal is equity and integration, or equity and some level of integrated schools, choice is a kind of strategy that might lead to that or not lead to that, depending on the context. So I'm wondering if, if you've thought about it, it, it. So in Boulder Valley, the context might suggest choice exacerbates segregation. In other contexts, it might, it might not. So I'm just wondering uh, if you could speak to what might be a, a policy that might ultimately take us to the goal of integration and equity, um, and whether you think in some contexts choice is appropriate or in most contexts it's not. Um, I do you think choice is appropriate? I just don't think that these consequences and outcomes are appropriate. So I guess, I mean, I argue for that our answers to this and our solutions need to be democratically negotiated among um, the public that's impacted. So I um, actually spoke to some people, some district and community members last week, and we focused on very different uh, issues. We were looking more specifically at schools in Lafayette, the schools, you know, the impact of schools in Lafayette, um, the need for more educators of color um, to look closely at discipline issues, dropout rates, you know, achievement gap, things like that. Um, I think like it's really complex. Like in one, we need to make sure that um, communities that are experiencing flight are just, that their needs are met in getting a good education for their kids. Um, two, you know, I talked about the benefits of integration, but at the same time, it's very complex. We need thoroughgoing integration in schools that requires a whole bunch more reform. So I think like there's several steps involved in talking in the community about what matters most, what are the first steps we can take um, towards those aims, if that makes sense. So, and one is raising awareness. You know, about half of, of parents in my study weren't aware that open enrollment increased segregation in the district. Um, many, only less than a third of parents in my study actually expressly liked open enrollment uh, policy, but felt compelled to participate um, because of how intense it is here, and, um, but were concerned about the negative consequences, so I think. Can I ask a very brief follow-up question, then I'll yeah. pass my mic, and Kevin, you can speak to it too. Do you think that Boulder Valley parents, and is there a legal basis for saying that when parents fundraise for their own school, that has to go in a, in a district-wide pot that gets distributed equally across schools, or even based on need, so that you don't have the right to 
donate only to your neighbor, your own school, but that you can only donate, say, to the district. Right. Yeah, that's some of the, the things that we talked about with the district, too. So um, when Ken and Margaret, Ken Howe and Margaret Eisenhart did their study, some of the recommendations they made to the district at the time included that um, it would 10% of funds that raised by more affluent schools would go to um, schools that couldn't raise as much. I'm sorry, they recommended 15%. The district implemented 10%, and that's the policy today. Um, so that is happening. You can see, though, that when a school can raise 100,000, you know, 10% of that, you're, um, going to the schools that can't raise as much, you know, it's still a huge inequity. And they are paying for things like literacy coaches and things that, you know, matter. So I think that that's another huge area for change that we can all get behind. I would I was just going to add that, that, you know, thinking about these court cases I was discussing, there's a, a constant wrestling the courts, the courts engage in between competing legitimate interests. So it's not, even when a, a court decides in favor of the state and against parents or vice versa, there isn't a dismissal of the other argument. Um, and so the, the, the idea that parental liberty is valuable, that, that parents' uh, choices on behalf of their children uh, is valuable, is sort of a beginning, a starting point for almost all these discussions. Um, but with something like, like choice, is the goal of, with this case, school choice, is the goal of a school choice policy the, the parental liberty in and of itself, or is it the policy, is it designed to accomplish some larger aim? Um, some larger educational aim or some, some larger aim in terms of civil society or something else. Um, so what happens in some places, not a lot, so uh, Louisville or what's called Jefferson County, Kentucky, uh, Berkeley, California, um, Seattle used to have a policy like this, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, there are various places that have implemented what are called constrained choice plans. Um, so the idea is you want to give, give parents as much choice as possible within the, the larger goal of trying to create uh, more diverse schools. Um, and, and so trying to find a way to balance those things is, is another a policy approach that I think personally. Okay, we had a question from Twitter. Um, okay, can we frame our choices in ways that advance equity for all children? Now it's for Terry Wilson. So I think, um, I think that's from Bill, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so I, can we actually do that? Is, I mean, so I, it was raised as an open question, I think, to the audience at the end. Um, I think that it is a challenge, but I think where I've been interested in following the opt-out movement is this emerging tension that I think that a lot of parents who are opting out of state assessments because they're concerned about education in general and they're concerned about corporate reform, they're concerned about the marketization of education. I think at the actual moment that they opt out, they're framing their choices in very individualist terms that undercut the political power of their concerns about the direction education is headed. And so I think that these issues of how we frame our choices and that our choices need to also be accompanied by other forms of political action and strategies about changing these systems, but also need to be informed by the consequences, they use Kristen's language, the broader consequences of those choices. Um, I just saw one of the other tweets up there about the consequences of choices um, in terms of funding for Title I schools. And I think that there are real issues of power and privilege in the opt-out movement. So many of the districts leading the opt-out charge are more affluent and suburban, and I think that there are real questions and tensions about who's getting to, who's the consequences of these decisions. And I think we do have to think about them in more public terms. But I think the challenge then is that when principals and teachers and parents and community members are asked, well, are you opting out your kid? Um, are, asked, are being asked to frame these choices and these conversations for parents and for students. And I think there's a lot of productive work we could do with framing the public consequences and redirecting action. I don't know how to do it, but I think there's work being done. Do we have a question here? Do I have this on? Okay, so I, I did want to make a comment. So as you said, BVSD, 10% of it goes back into the general fund. So most certainly the fundraising that our school has done, 10% of what we are able to accomplish goes back in. 
Denver Public Schools, zero. So, you know, they all keep it. So I, I would love to really encourage people to get involved. The legislative session has started and um, Colorado funding is pathetic. So we're, we rank varying from 40th to 47th in per pupil funding per, from nationally. So I, I just wanted to say that because it's the legislative session, so please. Um, my question for you, Terry, and I think part of the conversation with the opting out, it took 10 months for us to get the results from the park test. Um, I think there's a lot of questioning about how effective a test is when it takes 10 months to get the results and the delivery method of the testing. So we're talking about that equality, well, it's, it's on the computer. So now we're talking about maybe the lower income that don't have access to computers. So I guess my question to you is, don't you think that has played a role in this opting out and isn't that part of the conversation of what testing should look like in the future? Yeah, I think that the first concern you, I'm not as familiar with um, the second concern in some ways because I haven't seen that play out. I am from a time when we took tests on paper. But uh, in terms of the first concern, I do think that has been one of the main reasons that a lot of teachers and school leaders um, and parents and students have really mobilized. Like, what good are these tests if they can't drive instruction? And I think that those concerns are posed against like this rhetoric of how tests will drive um, school improvement, right? So they're sort of juxtaposed against this kind of dream of, you know, that the tests themselves will drive improvement because we'll be able to use them to change our instruction. And I think that, um, by and large, that's made impossible by the cycle. But I think that that cycle doesn't discount the claim that civil rights groups will make to say that, you know, let's just bracket the idea that tests should have anything to do with instruction. But don't we still need maybe an infrequent, non-difficult and stressful measure of how all kids are doing? And I think you could even bracket the idea that tests should do anything having to do with instruction or evaluation or anything and still grant out that there might be a claim there that there should be infrequent, fair, measured, reasonable assessment. That being said, I think that all good teachers are continually assessing their students and changing their instruction all the time, right? So I am not saying that assessment isn't linked to instruction. I think it can be in a much more organic and meaningful way. Um, and I agree that it probably isn't going to happen through the park test, but I think we should take down our expectations that should happen and try to think through what, what might be the claim that's left. Uh, yeah, so I, this question could really be for any of the panelists. I wanted to ask about something that I think uh, the three main cases that you discussed have in common, so the vaccination case, the school choice case, and the standardized test case. Uh, and that is in all three cases, it seems to me that if I opt out and most other people don't opt out, I'm getting a benefit or my child is getting a benefit from most other people uh, following the practice. So if, if I don't get my child vaccinated, but pretty much everyone else gets their child vaccinated, I get the benefits of the herd immunity without uh, the cost, let's say, or the risk you know, to my child. Um, if my child doesn't take the standardized test, but virtually everyone else's child takes the standardized test, I still get the benefit of good data being used to generate public policy and so forth. And if I don't send my child to my neighborhood school, but most parents send their child to their neighborhood school, uh, frankly, my property values are gonna be higher if people are mostly going to a good neighborhood school and so forth. So my question across any of these cases, I guess, is what you think of the idea that uh, if opting out is allowed in any of these cases, the people who opt out ought to have to pay some kind of compensation to uh, maybe the social, you know, the tax base or something like this to compensate for the fact that in effect they're free riding, they're, they're enjoying the benefits that are generated by most people complying and then they're, they're opting out individually. So really could be applied to any of these cases, I think. Uh, thanks. Um, so there is a, there is a free riding kind of question here. But the reason I didn't talk about that actually is that um, there are plenty of schools in Boulder where vaccination rates are below that needed for herd immunity, and so we're not, that's not our problem right now. The problem is getting to that rate in the first place. But, but um, I mean, certainly if we were there and then there, was, and there were few, still a few people opting out, there would be this question, well, aren't these people free riding, receiving a public good that they don't contribute to? And then I think the question would be whether uh, there's anyone who um, uh, we should give some kind of priority to in, in getting, getting that opportunity to free ride. And then, and then I guess that's where I think um, 
uh, people who have, for instance, religious, ex um, religious, good religious reasons to strong, from, from their perspective, strong religious reasons to opt out might be the people to prioritize. Um, my only thought is that, that there's always that issue, right? If I, if I ride my bike to work, then people drive and get there a little bit quicker. There are, there are so many areas in our society where our individual choices impact, impact other people and we're not trying to you know, create compensation issues. I do think that there are clear, I mean, I, I, I'm acknowledging what you're saying. I think there are clear free rider issues as a policy matter, as, as a real consideration. But I think somewhere the line has to be drawn. So if we do place that value on parental liberty, if we as a society, which we do, uh, value the, the um, giving parents options uh, about how to raise their child, um, that could be infringed on if we're always trying to figure out you know, th these compensation issues. So I mean, I, it's just it's a balancing issue, and I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. But I think there are. And I would just add that I think that one. Um, parallel theme that emerged across all of these different cases is the the weakness of a rights-based discourse in having these broader conversations about these larger public goods and the ways in which our individual choices contribute to larger public goods. So I would say that, you know, uh, in three different ways, I think we all are trying to say that we need to move the conversation beyond individual or parent rights is the sort of framing agenda to kind of issues of more of the interactivity and the democratic deliberation that we need when we're considering the trade-offs between individual rights and public rights. Okay, we have a question here and then right there. Um, <clears throat> my question's for Adam. Um, I'd like to know how one can claim that vaccines should be mandatory for public school children when vaccines are not without risk, nor are they entirely effective at keeping illness away, as proven by the following two points. One, the United States vaccine court system has paid over three and a half billion dollars to families of vaccine injured children. Two, vaccine manufacturer inserts claim that live vaccine shedding takes place for up to 28 days. Several of the childhood vaccines, such as measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox contain live viruses and are known to shed or make the vaccinated recipients contagious. Thus, the handful of recent outbreaks among highly vaccinated communities. It seems questionable to disregard this information, and I strongly believe that with the possible risk of serious adverse side effects and reactions, as well as vaccine-acquired illness from shedding, there must be parental choice without the threat of exclusion and segregation from the public, public school system? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so uh, no vaccine is 100% effective. Um, every uh, responsible uh, scientist will tell you that. And no vaccine is completely without risk. But the, to, say, to ask, um, are these vaccines completely effective and are they completely without risk is to ask the wrong question. The right question is, taking into account all of the expected benefits and all of the expected risks, on balance, do we expect most children to benefit, or even the vast majority of children to benefit from taking, getting these vaccines as opposed to not? And that's what the data shows. Um, so yes, we, we should definitely concede that there are some risks, not the risks, I don't, I don't totally agree with you about what the risks are, but there are definitely some risks, and the vaccines are not 100% effective, but uh, 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 but, but there's more to the story than that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, hold on one sec. We have, um, we're just about running out of time, and I wanted to make sure we got that one last question in. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. So my, my question is, uh, uh, first of all, for Terry, um, and one of the points you mentioned about the standardized tests was that you know they're, they're, they, they can be good ways to, uh, to help ensure equity. Right, within the schools, that we can look and find places where there are differences in the test scores that are based on race or socioeconomic status or something like this, and then try to rectify those issues. The one concern that I have with that, and I'm coming from a cognitive psychologist perspective, um, is that skills are really difficult to measure, really difficult to measure. And it turns out that if you look at a lot of what's coming out of the um, early child development literature and psychology and some of these other places, 
the skills that seem to make a, a, a prediction as to how, how much success people will have in life are things that are especially hard to measure, like self-regulation, right? So what I worry about a little bit um, is that in trying to use standardized tests as a way of measuring equity, we're actually making inequity worse because we are focusing on skills like reading, like being able to compute a math problem, things like this that actually are, are starting to, to look like they don't really have as much of an effect on later success in life as we would like them to. Um, and you know, we're, we're spending a lot of classroom time focusing on these types of skills when things like self-regulation may have a much bigger role to play and these, um, these sorts of skills may not be taught um, in, in, in some families and the only place for kids to get them really is in school. So if we're spending a lot of time teaching five-year-olds to read instead of how to regulate themselves, are we potentially um, increasing some of the uh, inequities in our, in our public education system? Um, thanks for the thoughtful question and the framing. Um, I think that I would just make, I think, two points. I think one in sort of trying to lift up the challenge posed by these civil rights groups um, I think it's, it is the toughest challenge um, that opt-out advocates are facing. And I think that those groups would not say that testing ensures equity, right? They would say that testing is, the standardized tests that we have have improved, but they are an imperfect and partial measure of inequalities that happen, particularly across lines of race and class. And I think that you can still say that um, that sort of grant out that point, but also make room for the concerns that you have. And I think that there needs to be a broader democratic process of deciding the ends of education that we really care about and how we would go about measuring them. And I think we've made big strides, but certainly the standardized tests do not measure everything that counts. Um, in addition to the things you mentioned, issues of creativity and citizenship and um, social, emotional well-being happiness, many, many things that are very important goods are not measured, but they are a limited and partial window on, on large inequalities that do exist and should be diagnosed and addressed. Okay, so we have strict instructions from the library that we have to be out of here in a very short amount of time.